hang out. My name is Eric Roden, and I am the editor-in-chief of Fire Rescue Magazine. Today's kind of a special hunt to hang out because uh, Bobby Haltman and Chief Lasky have allowed uh, a few of us to hijack this week's hunt to hang out to talk about some things urban and definitely two hands-on training classes at FDIC this year that are must-attends. Now, I have to say, FDIC is only 62 days away, so please, please, please register now. Go to FDIC.com, get your registrations in. The classes are almost full. You need to get in as soon as possible uh, if you plan on taking any of these great courses. So, um, unfortunately, Ray McCormick will not be joining us today. We're having some technical difficulties. Uh, maybe we can get him on uh, later in the broadcast, and we're also um, waiting on one more guest. But I am joined by two of the best in the fire service um, who were able to get on with us this morning and take some time out of their day to help hijack this week's hangout with us. And I have uh, uh, Chief Nick Martin from the Columbia, South Carolina Fire Department, and Captain Gabe and Jemmy from the Canada, New Jersey Fire Department joining us. Uh, again, two of the best in the business, uh, two very experienced firefighters in our urban setting. And I wanted to start out by, I guess, just you know, mentioning why we're talking about urban firefighting uh, today. And we're not going to be talking about it from any type of biggest, baddest, elitist perspective. Some of the, the connotations you might uh, infer from, from the word urban fire, or the two words urban firefighting, I should say. And, you know, I'll, I'll make it descriptive by using the, the simple uh, Google and cheating off of uh, Merriam-Webster's definition of urban being, and I quote, of relating to the characteristics um, of cities and the people who live in them. Now, to a lot of you watching today, it might seem, you know, it's kind of a, a, a very generic description of urban firefighting, but it's very telling with regards to the urban fire service because uh, characteristics is, is kind of being the, the, the main variable in that definition. Uh, and by characteristics of, of the urban setting, I'm talking about the, um, not just the, the socioeconomics that, that we encounter in many of our urban centers, but the types of fire buildings, the um, deployment uh, of, of the fire departments, the legacy construction that's encountered, the aged and vintage buildings that we're fighting fires in, um, you know, the, the, again, the population densities, the movement, the trends, etc. cetera, um, all of that plays into um, what an urban fire, to fire, urban fire department is tasked with protecting. And over the course of years and a uh, century or two, we've been uh, very diligent in adapting and, and overcoming um, some of these trends to provide uh, a phenomenal fire service to our constituents. So um, with that, uh, I guess we'll uh, first get into a couple introductions here because I, I'd like uh, two of our guests here to kind of give a little bit of their background, who they are, where they work, and um, some, some things they have going on here. And I do want to also, as an aside, uh, mention to ask us questions today. We have a tremendous amount of um, experience um, sitting here with my guests with, with Nick and Gabe, and we'd love to answer your questions. We'd like to uh, discuss the topics that you guys uh, have on your minds. So I want you guys to go to Twitter and enter uh, or, or send your questions to hashtag FE Talk. Again, hashtag FE Talk. Ask us some questions. We, we'd love to chat with you guys and, and kind of get in your heads, too, to see what, what you guys are, are facing and, and dealing with these days. Um, so with that, uh, Nick, do you want to give us a, a little background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks uh, Thanks again um, for inviting me to be part of today's show. I'm, I'm glad to be able to chat with you guys. Uh, my name's uh, Nick Martin. I've been in the fire department, I guess, uh, about 22 years now, uh, and I'm presently the uh, chief of training for the Columbia, South Carolina Fire Department, which is the uh, capital city of South Carolina and the state's largest fire department. And uh, we're fortunate to protect a, a, a very diverse service area that includes everything from the, the downtown high-rises and state capital to some... Uh, economically depressed urban areas, some very nice areas, and uh, something I kind of jot down to talk about later, some some rural areas that mimic a lot of the challenges I think we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, prior to, to coming to Columbia, I worked for the District of Columbia Fire Department uh, for a number of years and, and uh, worked through the ranks uh, up to fire lieutenant and uh, was very proud to operate in uh, a lot of the environments that we're going to talk about today and, and even better to meet a lot of the uh, a lot of the people who taught me uh, what I know and, and eventually introduced me to the guys like you and let me hang out with you all today. Great. All right, Gabe. All right. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, I'm in my 17th year uh, in the city of Camden, New Jersey. We're right over the bridge from Philadelphia. I spent most of my career uh, assigned to special operations companies. Um, I think I was in my second year when they, they converted Engine 7, uh, our, our busiest engine company into a squad and uh, really hit our sock stuff hard. Um, at that point, I had made it a point to want to get transferred to the rescue. I started doing the New Jersey Task Force 1. I passed the evals and got involved with the urban search and rescue for the state. Um, and then I was transferred to the rescue, so I maybe did seven years in squad seven and a, maybe another eight in the rescue company before I made it to captain. Uh, of an engine company. Um, our, our rescue at Work and Fires is, is citywide and basically acts like a truck on steroids. Um, they're almost like free safeties. Uh, beautiful way to learn your trade, beautiful way to get experience. You go citywide and uh, get to do primary searches and, and for, a lot of forcible entry work. Um, so I, I've done a tremendous amount of that. I've been able to, to Luckily, work with a lot of very experienced guys. That, uh, one of my senior men at the rescue had as many years in the rescue in Camden as I had been alive at the time. So um, it was a privilege to work there. And, and now that I'm promoted out, I, I really do miss it. And uh, not like I'm not still fighting fires or whatever, but uh, I miss the guys in that company a lot. Um, oh, hey, Josh, I see. I see. Next guy talking. He's finally on now. So uh, I guess I'll just pass it over to Josh. Let him give his introduction now, handsome man that he is. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I could not get the computer to work, so I'm on my phone. We'll see how that works out. Uh, Josh Materi, I started the fire service in 98, and I've been on Rescue One in Seattle Fire Department for the last uh, three years. Happy to be here. And if you hear some babies crying in the background, I might have to bounce out. No worries. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, folks. Yeah, just a tremendous group here talking with us today. And uh, I think we'll start out by by first kind of you know discussing some of the the, the types of fire buildings that were that we're operating in. Um, you know, we often hear legacy construction versus modern construction, but um, you know, Nick, I know you just posted something on balloon framing. Um, you just had a, a real good post about fire dropping down. Uh, at, at a decent job you guys had there the other day, but you know that that's very um, uh, very common in my city where I work, and uh, it's, it's essentially our, our bread and butter fire building. But um, what you know, what are some of the the fire buildings that you guys are experiencing um, out there in Columbia? Uh, a lot of you know, I, I think in like any large fire department, that kind of uh, varies by geographic area within the fire department. Um, but for us, we, we run quite a bit of, I guess, what will be considered in today's terminology, le legacy buildings. I mean, a lot of this is an old city um, with a lot of old buildings, some of which <laughs> have been well-maintained and some of which have not been well-maintained. But like any older buildings, pose a lot of interesting challenges like that thing you mentioned I posted earlier and, and stuff like that. I mean, I, if, I had to, if I had to throw some numbers at it, I would say our most common fire type is in a one-story wood frame house that was probably built, you know, somewhere between 50 to 60 years ago, or maybe 40 years ago. Um, after that, you know, two and three-story apartment buildings, uh, brick in nature, open center core hallways. Uh, that was one thing interesting mo moving from the northeast to the south is that our garden-style apartments went from uh, the majority in the north being enclosed stairwell to down here. There's quite a bit of uh, open stairwell because of the change. Uh, in the weather. Um, I would say those are our most common buildings and then you know one thing we do have a lot of is weird commercial buildings like uh, you know the, the, they're not they're not cookie cutter like a lot of areas are um, but I mean just all different configurations of strip malls and uh, you know one-story industrial buildings and, and things of that nature. You know, and I guess that that's uh, a good segue into a question we just received on our uh, Twitter uh, again, folks, if you have any questions, uh, you know, again, we're, you know, I'm sitting joined by three of the, three of the best, so these are definitely the people that ask us questions of uh, today. So go to Twitter and uh, use hashtag FETalk. Uh, ask your questions, post them, we'll be answering. We just received a, 
a really good one, um, which will kind of segue into a, another part of the conversation I'd like to have, and that's, do you think the tactics used and developed in urban fire departments are universal? Um, I guess I, I can start off by that. I will say uh, absolutely. Um, just because you hear the words um, vacant or you hear one story ranch, um, you know those can be found in, in, in any town. Obviously, you may not have the fortification that you might have in Seattle, Milwaukee, you know, Columbia, Camden, or or um, other places on your vacants. Uh, vacants still pose uh, similar hazards, etc. So you can develop. Uh, standard operating procedures and deployment models based on on, on those types of fire rules. So, I guess, uh, what are your what are you guys' thoughts on those those questions? Do you think that um, the tactics that are developed in 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 our in our urban cities um, are they universal to any town in the USA? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they are. I, I think every obviously every fire is different, um, and. and the fire isn't the problem uh, as much as the building that contains the fire is, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, I think that, you know, obviously new construction is what it is. And, and, and in places where, like I work, where you're dealing with 100-year-old plus um, buildings or, or dwellings, um, the tactics that we use are obviously adaptable to pretty much anything else. So. You keep hearing the term urban this or urban that. I don't think that it doesn't uh, carry over up to other buildings. I mean, even when you go out to the suburbs, some of the buildings are, are not too far off construction-wise as far as age is concerned. Um, fire, fire spread and uh, void spaces and all that, as long as you're aware of your first due local or even if you're a, a, a citywide company or a mutual aid company, you have to know the buildings that are in those parts of town and, and how old they are and where your, your fire is going to travel and spread and where you need to go and look for it when you have a fire in that type of, of building. Um, so I think urban tactics are just basically fire tactics. They might happen a little bit more repetitively than, than a suburban setting, obviously, but um, I, I think they certainly carry over. And, uh, you know, an ordinary constructed building in in Camden is going to be an ordinary constructed building in, in Cherry Hill, like even if it was built 30 years after the fact. So um, I think a lot of times the fire service uh, tends to get hung up on words or thought process of a given geographic, if that makes any sense. So um, yeah, I, I, in answer to that question, I think that they are universal and uh, tactics are tactics as long as you're willing to understand what you have in front of you and adopt or incorporate a given tactic into that building, I, I think you're in good shape. You know, and, and that's why I wanted to throw that definition out right away at the beginning of the, the hour here. Um, you know, there are certain connotations with urban, you know, whether it be socioeconomic, whether it be um, the number of fire companies, um, you know, et cetera. You know, Gabe, I think, hit it right on the head by, by saying that, that everything is applicable. And fire tactics are essentially fire tactics. But if you look at the, the age of the structure and the, you know, the layouts, um, obviously, you know, where I work, um, neighborhoods are cookie cutter. Areas of the city are cookie cutter. So, you know, a taxpayer on one side of town is going to essentially require the, the same tactics as another part of town just based on the, the similar type and design. So, um, you know, I, I think, Gabe, you, you bring up a, a great point. Now, obviously, uh, we have Josh here from from Seattle on our our PAC Northwest. What are some of the the typical fire buildings that you guys are seeing, and do you think that some of the the tactics that you guys employ in those types of fire buildings, uh, or do you think they're universal to um, the rest of the country? I do. Uh, I do think that the tactics are universal. What the difference really is is the the staffing. Uh, obviously, Seattle's running one and three on engines and trucks, so our timing is going to be a little different from companies that are running one and five. Um, but the buildings are the buildings, and typically our fire buildings are one and a half, two and a half story, single family dwellings. Um, one of the things I enjoy about Seattle is we have quite a bit of diversity as far as, as, far as building construction with, you know, being an old city for the West Coast, it's a pretty old city. So we have a lot of the, you know, craftsmen's built in the 20s and in the teens, uh, all the way up to lightweight, new construction, garden apartments, um, old law apartments. Uh, we have a little bit of everything, but probably our primary fire building is probably a one and a half story bungalow, 
maybe 1,600 square feet, um, built in the 20s. It's probably where most of our fire duty is at. Um, as far as if that building's in suburban America or if it's in urban America, I think the fire behavior is the same. The layouts are typically the same. So I don't think there's any difference. The only issue is, you know, suburban and rural fire departments typically don't have the same staffing, so the timing might be different. The um, But as far as the fire behavior, it's the same. The buildings are the same. They don't know if they're on the East Coast, West Coast, urban, suburban, and even – like in my area and some of the suburban areas are starting to mimic urban fire department challenges with some of the forcible entry challenges and everything else with uh, some of the same security features. So the only issue I see, the difference is the staffing. You know, and I, I think that's a, um, you know, a good point in the conversation to, to discuss staffing with regards to our, our, our universal tactics. And, and, and I definitely agree with um, the fire behavior in these types of buildings. Um, I, I do think we tend to look uh, geographically almost to a fault, um, you know, w with regards to how we apply certain things. And we, I have seen a lot of fire departments also take on that defeatist mentality of, like, well, we don't staff like Seattle. I can't get 35 people to a fire um, in five minutes, so we can't do things. So we'll, we can touch on that uh, a little bit uh, later in the hour. But, um, but I think it's a good good point in the conversation to to discuss staffing and essentially. Maybe one distinction that you'll see in, in urban fire departments, um, you know, which is, you know, considered a luxury by by many in the the collective fire service, but also per presents its inherent challenges um, with regards to, you know, obviously the firefighter mindset. Now, um, in Columbia and in, in Seattle, um, you know, Camden and in, in Milwaukee, um, you're going to get a, a a lot of people there in, in a rapid or in, in, in short order, you know. Um, where I work, I can anticipate getting 35 people there in, in about five minutes. And <clears throat> with that, uh, um, although that's great, especially as, as a battalion chief like myself sitting there on the street, um, the challenge becomes managing adequate resources, I guess is a, is a good way to put it, because I have 35 firefighters that have positional assignments based on their order of arrival, and they all want to get to where they're supposed to be operating the second they get there. Um, so you know, there has to be, you know, uh, uh, kind of, I guess, a different management perspective um, with regards to managing these adequate resources and in, ensuring everything's going according to plan. Um, conversely, uh, a lot of fire departments are essentially placing people as they arrive, and, and that can be challenging as well. So I guess let's kind of touch on that with regards to, you know, how our standard operating procedures are established, developed, trained on, et cetera. Uh, I think this would be a good question for, for Nick to start out with. Um, let's talk about, again, managing these adequate resources and how we're going to uh, develop our standard operating procedures based on these, these fire buildings and some of their universal uh, challenges. What do you think about that, Nick? But I, think it, I think it all ties together. Um, the, uh, I'm going to echo. Is that me? Uh, I think it kind of all ties together um, from, uh, you know, to what we were just talking about, about the tactics kind of thing to uh, the SOGs and staffing. And we have a unique situation here in Columbia. We protect about 800 square miles, which like I said is uh, you know everything from the downtown grid to the absolute middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean so a, a box downtown right now you know might very quickly get 27 people you know on the scene, uh, whereas a fire out in our more rural environments where we actually run quite a bit of fire, um, you know we had one yesterday uh, that I was on where you know if there there was less than 10 people there for at least the first 10 minutes including the chiefs um, and half of those guys were driving tankers and you know they you know in a rural water supply environment and they kicked the I'm looking for a safe word I can say <laughs> out of this fire I mean I saw that after I said I'm so impressed you know you guys put out a county fire you know, you, you took a city fire and put it out, you know, just in the county, just, just like it was, you know, full staffing and resources here because they made smart decisions and because they adapted things a little bit. And just to regress a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, when you say, you know, are these things, these urban things universal, there's a couple things, you know, are you asking, are they universal between urban departments, you know, between Camden and Columbia or between, you know, Camden and Milwaukee, or are they universal 
between you know urban departments and rural departments? And I think the answer is to both is kind of yes, because all of this is based around strategy. And, and whether I'm in the middle of the city or whether I'm in the middle of nowhere, my number one strategy, what I want the end picture to look like, because I want to put the fire out where I found it, I want to get the people out, and I want to keep my firefighters safe. And that doesn't matter whether I've got fully staffed or no staffed fire trucks. So that's what I want to do. And then if I kind of skip a level, which I'll come back to, and I talk about the task level, I don't care if I'm in the middle of Brooklyn or if I'm in the middle of you know nowhere, you know, the best way to force an inward opening door is the best way to force an inward opening door, regardless of where you happen to be standing geographically with the Halligan Bar, for example. So when you get to that task level, the best way to do something is the best way to do something, whether that's considered an urban way or, or not. Um, it's the middle level, you know, the tactical level, how we accomplish the strategy we want to do that has to vary a little bit because when I have 27 people downtown, I can knock out four or five different things at once. But when I have maybe six, you know, functional people that I can put inside of a fire building, I've got to accomplish that strategy of containing the fire, saving the people, and protecting our people in a slightly different manner. You know, all understanding that the citizen doesn't care where they live or who you are, they all expect the hero firefighters to come put the fire out, you know, no matter where they come from. Um, and, and tying that into SOGs, you know, that was unique for us in developing our SOGs because we had to develop operating guidelines that fit that diversity and environment in 800 square miles in low staffing, in, in like low staffing and in good staffing areas. And really what that looks like, you know, if you, if you get a copy of our policies, which we're happy to share, you know, is there's a paragraph at the beginning of the how to fight fire section that says, and I'm paraphrasing greatly here, but hey, out in the rural area, we understand you're dealing with water and manpower shortages. And we understand you can't follow this to the letter of the law. But what we want you to do is focus on achievable goals. You know, as people show up, we're looking primarily to accomplish things in this kind of order. Um, and, you know, some of our, uh, our battalion chiefs that operate in those rural areas have come up with some great plans on how to adapt, you know, to their environment and function, uh, you know, with that limited manpower and the fact that limited manpower is usually accompanied by limited water, which just complicates your manpower uh, problem. But, you know, I think that SOGs uh, need to be rigid and flexible at the same time. But, you know, and, and I mean that to say that what we're doing is we're focusing on uh, what we want the end picture to look like when we're done with this fire, understanding that if, if the, the staffing levels are not equal for all players involved, then we have to provide some wiggle room for them to be able to make that adaptation. Yeah, excellent. You know, and we received an, another question on Twitter here, actually more of a comment. Um, that tactics are universal, uh, you just may have to adapt less. And I guess uh, this is a question for the group. You know, if we are running with, you know, or arriving with 10 or fewer people uh, initially, and we have certain primary duties and responsibilities, uh, what would be, let's say, the first two um, in any of our type of uh, fire buildings here? What, what are the two most important things that we need to do with the minimal amount of people? I have a loaded question, but I just want to kind of get a consensus from the group, and I think we can, we can uh, you know, discuss a lot of things off of that, that question alone. Put the fire out. Excellent. Yeah, Nick, Nick just nailed it. I mean, putting the fire out is, is the most important thing, getting water on the seat of the fire as soon as possible. And, I mean, obviously all that is trumped by uh, life safety concerns. I mean, if you have to basically drop everything as the first arriving company to, to rescue people, you, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, life safety is the paramount. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Search, search and life safety. Search and, and put the fire out, get a stretch of the line, put water on the fire, and search are the two and most important. If I had to pick two, that's the first two things I'm going to do. And that's excellent. You guys, uh, you guys definitely answered the you know the way I think the the group would have anyway. Um, does that involve maybe teaming up, maybe the first engine truck or tanker or ambulance on the first hose line? Or how would we consider maybe splitting some of these companies arriving? Uh, do we search along with the hose line? Do we put people inside the fire building um, simultaneously? I mean, what I guess I guess what's the 
the strategy and the mindset that, that we should take uh, on these fire buildings when we arrive at these short periods, knowing that we're getting uh, successive resources uh, on this incident. Okay. Well, it, oh. I'm, go ahead, Chief. No, no, you first. I, I was going to say, basically, it, it really comes down to, to the staffing levels, but since you quantified that by saying that you have a known staffing, um, you know, obviously life safety takes precedent over all other, other things on, on the fire ground, and uh, I, I'm lucky to, to have engine and truck companies uh, with four on each rig, um, so I, I can't quite speak to having to wait X amount of time for a given resource to arrive from a particular agency. So, that's why I was going to defer to the chief on this because what he was just saying about um, the, the urban fire department in a, in a rural setting um, really plays into this because I've read a lot of NIOSH reports where there's been very complicated issues combining several resources to do one function. So instead of having an engine company show up with an officer and three firefighters that can start handling X, Y, and Z and a truck company right behind them, if you're starting to... Uh, couple resources together, like two guys from an ambulance and, and maybe one guy from an engine and one guy from a truck, then um, coordination becomes that much more complicated and, and compounded. Uh, that That's a big issue when you're trying to um, keep tabs on, on people, like, you know, so who is whose boss and, and where are these people going within the building, where's the accountability and, and so on and so forth. So uh, you, you start to... Um, lessen the safety when you combine resources to do one single function. If that, yeah, that's one of the advantages of an SOP type system is the predictability yeah. of whose jobs to do what and what order they arrive in, and they're responsible for X, Y, and Z. And when you start piecemealing companies together, it gets, I think, in my opinion, more challenging and, and dangerous. But you got to do what you got to do. Like what Chief is talking about with limited staffing out in the rural areas. It's harder to act in that urban kind of systematic SOP driven type system when you have more variables. Where in most of the urban environments, there are more constants and less variables. You you know you're getting, you know, four engines and two trucks in this amount of time, and you can predict order of arrival and who's responsible for what. I mean, uh, that that's something we deal quite a quite a bit with um, to to talk about that uh, strange staffing environment. Um, we have a lot of firehouses or, or some firehouses that are staffed with the engine has one guy on it driving um, and may have in the house, well, there's four of them, um, a, a rescue company. We have you know, a little background. Our, our big rescue company, Rescue One, is a standard four-person, what you would think of, heavy rescue. And our other four rescue companies are somewhat of a medium-duty flying squad. Um, and they they might operate in, in in one or two manners when they arrive on a fire. Um, if if one of them goes out with the engine they're paired with first due to a house fire, they're basically not going to have rescue duties. They're going to take that three person crew that's on that rescue and team up with the one guy driving the engine. And for all intents and purposes, they're one engine company that arrived on two vehicles. You know, and if that rescue company were to arrive. Later in the incident, as the as the rescue company, they would be operating, uh, like Gabe was saying earlier, similarly to a truck company. And one thing we've kind of done to clarify that, because you do run into issues with dispatch order, and somebody was at the grocery store, so they beat somebody in or don't or get beat in. We announce our arrival order. So we'll, we'll you know when re if rescue three announces, you know rescue three is on scene, first due support. That means they're the first due support company, and they're assuming this set of responsibilities that's outlined in our SOG, and we know that. Okay, now we'll move on to the next thing. Or if they announce on the scene, Rescue 3 is on scene operating with Engine 27, first due engine. Okay, we know they're not doing support jobs. They are operating basically as the engine company. There's the void that we need to fill. Um, so there, you know, I, I kind of half tweeted it this afternoon because it was something that was just on my mind. I don't mean this at all to put people in a box. But it seems like these days, phrases like thinking outside the box and it's another tool in the toolbox have just become a free excuse to do whatever you want and claim it as something ingenious. And sometimes it, sometimes <laughs> it was ingenious and sometimes it was just authorized stupidity. I mean, you know, a hammer is a tool too. That doesn't mean I should hammer screws in just because it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of things in our environments, in all of our environments that, like Josh was saying, is predictable. 
is, is truly predictable. It might be unique. It might be challenging. It might, you know, you might not be able to predict every second of it. But nobody, very few departments woke up and said, oh, my God, nobody came to work today. We have, like, no staffing. You know, that some volunteer agencies do deal with that. But, you know, uh, for the majority of time, we have a pretty good uh, idea on how plus or minus how many people are going to show up and plus or minus when they're going to show up. And we should be making plans to whatever degree we can in advance because the more that we plan for in advance, the more brain time, radio time, you know, talking time exists to talk about the specifics of the incident we're going to right now rather than reinventing the wheel doing the same ten things we did on the last fire. You know, I tell you, this is, sorry, go ahead, Josh. I was saying you could, like what, what Chief is saying, you can, there's a lot of information and a lot of decisions I'd have to make, and if you, you compartmentalize the issues and, and, and allow people to focus on, on their 15% of the problem, they can do that 15% better than if they're looking at the big picture and uh, try to take in all the information and make decisions on, like, orchestrate every move that has to be made on the fire ground, when in reality, if I just play my position, play my role, I can play my role and do my job better because I'm not using brain power, you know, energy on somebody else's job or somebody else's responsibility. So just to dovetail on what Chief said, I, mm -hmm. I always agree with what he says. I just, <laughs> and one, one more thing is, like, fires are all, always all different. Like, I, I hear that, and, and Gabe said that, but... And they are, especially like in Chiefs District where you have, you know, more variables. But I, I would argue in most of our urban environments, they're more the same than they are different. You know, they they vary a little bit. And not to take away from that, they are all different. And it is a dynamic job, and, and there is a lot of decisions that have to be made. But I, I would argue that they are more the same than they are different. So having that as a reality, then it allows us to focus on what are our priorities we, we have to make a search on this, we have to ventilate this, we have to ladder this, we have to stretch and attack the fire. So we do more of the same, we do all those things on every fire, so let's focus on who's doing it and make sure it's a redundant system and there's a backup plan for those tasks. And that is all. You know, I tell you what, that's a, it's a great point, Josh, because obviously, you know, we're not going to stretch those lines at every fire that warrants one, and we want to put it in the same place every time based on that that type of fire building. So, you know, that, that cookie cutter firefighting and that universal uh, firefighting, uh, those universal tactics, uh, you know, do bode well for us. It allows us to, again, you know, gain that rapidity and, and kind of, you know, empirically test what works and what doesn't work uh, and then put it down on paper and send it off to Nick at the training academy to train the departments on. Um, now, with that, uh, you know, we received another question that I kind of parlay into, to, I guess, uh, another part of our discussion here is, uh, based on that, uh, on the rapidity and the cookie cutter type firefighting that that a lot of the urban fire, fire or urban fire departments are doing, um, do we feel that tool usage and uh, firefighter capabilities have been influenced by urban firefighters and their operations? Are the, are the vendors listening to? Uh, and or or taking notes from our urban firefighters and developing the tools, tactics. Again, that's kind of a rhetorical question as well. But uh, as we've seen some, you know, some of some tools that have come emerge from some of our fire departments with particular names on them. But uh, do you feel uh, that much of what, you know, the universal and collective fire service is using now was, in fact, you know, perhaps developed by urban firefighters? The first thing that pops in my head is is no, and it's the in my example is the pre-plumbed waterway, and I think that is a probably more a suburban, um, influenced by suburban fire departments more than urban. And for some reason, we went to all pre-plumbed waterways, and it is, we can't get far enough away from the building in an urban environment to have that pre-plumbed waterway not an issue. It's always in the way, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't add us. There's no bang for the buck. You know, if the risk-benefit risk analysis says, what are, we, what are we gaining by having pre-plumbed waterways versus what are we losing? And I think we're losing the ability to hit a lot of targets that we would typically have if we didn't have that water. So that was the first thing that popped in my head. I wish it had more. We had more influence on on that sort of thing. Uh, the other one is high hose beds. I think that's more driven by bigger <laughs> tankers or bigger uh, tanks in maybe rural environments. I was at the fire garage yesterday, and I bet the hose bed on our new engine spec is 
a foot over my head, and I'm I'd, I like to say I'm six foot tall, but my wife scoffs at me. She says I'm not six foot tall, but it's it's over my head. And my wife scoffs at that one too. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I think both of those are not driven by urban environments. So, well, well the, one of the other c converse issues to that, Josh, is that you said it yourself. That truck was spec, so that's incumbent on the agency to, to deal with. Whereas in my place, where we you know, the municipality will say, hey, here, here's $500,000. You have to spend it in two days. I, I mean, like, we haven't spec'd a yeah. truck for a couple of years now. And, and the last truck we did spec was a tiller that has a pre-piped waterway. And, and I love your take on the, the tool question, um, getting away from, like, hand tools and actual mm -hmm. stuff that we really do use. Um it blows my mind that, like in a, in this day and age, where we're we're unable to spec our own trucks for our own areas. You know, like we have a hose bed that looks like it has a Trinity staircase up the up the step board to to the hose bed, and you know, it, it leads to time loss injuries. It slows down the operation on the fire ground, and uh, and it's unsafe to, to climb on and off to pack. I mean, we're 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 more worried about the netting on and NFPA compliance than we are the usability of our apparatus. Um, and, and, you know, when it's spec that way, that's one thing. When, when you really have no other option but to just at least you have a new fire truck to replace one that's, you know, getting destroyed with 100 plus thousand miles on it. Um, it you know, obviously the comparison is different, but uh, I'm with you. I think that if we're specking something like that, it should definitely be for that local or for that given department, so that I mean everything is as close to the same page as possible. And and if a guy's detailed to another engine, he doesn't really have to think too hard about the tools or the setup on this rig versus what he just left at his old firehouse. You know, um, I, I I'm a big fan of. Uh, the seamless transition, you know, like if you're leaving an engine company on the east side of town, you go to the south side of town, the engine that you're going to work off of should, you know, by all intents and purposes, be set up pretty similar to the fire truck that you just left. You, you follow me? I, I think that in that regard, our tools and setups should, should kind of flow a little bit um, more across the board. Hey, uh, I, I want to take a couple of twists on, on Ray's uh, question there. I mean, Tool capability I mean, is absolutely influenced by urban firefighting. I mean, no matter how that you know how that gets to be, or whether it's good or bad. I mean, you know, some some fire department, in this little place outside Yonkers, started carrying a, a set of irons and a hook and a can off the ladder truck, and all of a sudden you go anywhere in the country, and everybody's bringing bringing those kind of tools. You know, some of the most ingenious new forcible entry tools that you see out there were first invented by some guy with an idea and a welder in the basement of his firehouse. And as an as an aside, a pet peeve of that to mine is, uh, uh, you know, I I I know some I've known of some stories where those kind of tools were invented by great men, some of which who are no longer with us, and then were picked up by a manufacturer and sold for dollars with no credit to the guy who actually made it. Um, that's a little pet peeve, I guess, for another conversation. But um, I want to take a little twist on the back half of Ray's question there about firefighting capability. Um, and I, I don't think Ray really meant it this way, but it, it's going to make me talk about it this way. And, you know, I, I mean that to say, and I'm, I'm not shy of saying something controversial, but when I worked in an environment where we would routinely get 45-some people on a one-alarm fire in a regular-sized building, you know, in the first 10 minutes, uh, you know, you didn't have to... If you weren't a great firefighter, you could disappear into the crowd. Uh, you know, now I, I work in an environment where, like I alluded to earlier, you know, for the first 15 minutes of firefighting, there's six guys who are going to go in or not go in and put this thing out. And uh, if you're not a great firefighter, there's no crowd to hide in. Um, so, you know, I think in some sometimes some guys can feel uh, pushed aside if they don't feel that they're part of the urban firefighting club, you know, almost as if that's an elitist thing or whatever. But, I mean, i got to give props to some of these guys that work in the outlying areas or whatever because if you're not on your game in these reduced manpower environments, there is nowhere to hide and there is nobody to pick up your slack for you. Yeah, no, I agree. It definitely, it's it's there for all to see, you know. Um, 
You know, I guess you know we're looking at at about 20 more minutes left, and what I really wanted to do is kind of, I guess, you know, summarize all of uh, all of what we've been talking about and, and kind of apply it to our urban fire grounds with regards to uh, obviously we, we've established you know how our recipes are developed, our staffing levels, um, areas of responsibility, things we need to do and, and consider. Obviously, putting the fire out, but um, there are parts of our urban areas, even our, our suburban areas, where our buildings are fortified and they present uh, significant challenges to us getting in there even applying our standard operating procedures. And, you know, obviously, you know, this is recognized by many of our urban firefighters, maybe not so much our, our suburban or exurban firefighters. Uh, however, the, you know, the, the skill sets required to overcome these obstacles are, are necessary for, for any fire department. And, um, you know, like say, you know, hats off to, to Nick and his crew with their truck essentials class. And, um, Obviously, with, with with everything that we're we're seeing, uh, we we also felt that there was a a, a needed course or hands-on training class at FDIC that addressed some of the oddball stuff that you'll see. Not just you know not just window bars per se or or VPS, but certain types of drop bars and locks and and assemblies and and additions that you'll find from these property owners to secure their facilities. Um, so we developed the the Urban Essentials hands-on training class at FDIC. Uh, and any alumni watching today can can surely attest to, you know, the intricacies that, that are taught in this course, the the myriad uh, subject matter that's covered in, in, in eight short hours, uh, even though it's an all-day class, is definitely a, a very, very full day. Um, and, you know, if, 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 if you're looking to take a class that might have something, you know, a little different or something that might be a little unconventional to, uh, to what you're used to, it's a very good class to take because it'll definitely introduce you at the, at the very least um, to things that you are likely going to encounter in the near future, um, as well as the you know the foundational and, and incredible um, truck company operations that you'll get in the truck essentials class. So um, I guess we we can start off with uh, with Nick. Uh, I'd like you to kind of you know you know plug your course. Let us know what what you guys are teaching in there with regards to you know, urban fire ground and tactics, how it can be applied to our, our, our suburban, exurban areas and rural areas for that matter, and, um, and, and some of the things you can expect to, to see in that class as, a, as an attendee. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's been a privilege of mine. I guess this is uh, my fourth year, I guess now, that I'll be going back as part of the Truck Essentials crew, which is led by the, the legendary Mike Champo. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of one of the rookies on the crew. There's a great group of guys there from all over the country, from Orlando, from Austin, uh, from Wichita, uh, from D.C., and uh, the, the great thing about it is it brings together, just like the urban class, it brings together mindsets not just from one place but from a variety of different departments and how we tackle those challenges. And I, I guess if I had to compare and contrast the two, you know, what what we're doing in the truck essentials thing is, is exactly what we said. We're, we're hitting a lot of the essentials topics. So, you know, it's a little bit of forcible entry. It's a little bit of ladder work. It's a little bit of rescue or search and rescue work. It's a little bit of ventilation. And, it, and it's kind of a myriad of some of the best tricks and tips out there for getting those kinds of skills done. And, and we try and kind of angle it in a lot of different environments. You know, we try and we don't just show you the two-man, you know, ways of forcing a door we show you the one-man ways of doing or the one-man, you know, ways of, of throwing the ladder or, you know, why VES is a valuable tactic in a low staffing environment. It's still valuable in a high staffing environment too, but, you know, it, it's it's definitely a great day and I think that, you know, one of the things that makes it really cool for us as the instructor cadre is uh, for better or for worse, we have like no idea what kind of building we're going to get, which is, which is, which is awesome because, you know, sitting in your firehouse right now, waiting for the bell to, bell to ring, you have no idea what kind of building you're going to get. And whatever challenges that building has for you and you pull up with fire showing out of it, you're going to have to adapt to those. And so, you know, we're able to take a real building off in there in the city of Indianapolis or around it. Uh, we screw it up all, all kinds of different ways, and then we make you overcome the same challenges that, that you would have to overcome if you were sitting in that first due area and, and the bell rang for that house. So, you know, another eight-hour day, uh, you know, you can't lose by being in either of these two programs. And, uh, you know, either way, you know, whether you're in both of our programs, one of them or none of them, you know, we're all on the circuit out there. You know the familiar spots out there on the street during FDIC week, and we hope that if you see us out there at the uh, local uh, milk drinking facility, you'll stop and, you know, chat us up and, and, and tell us what you're thinking or what you've been dealing with. 
You know, you, you bring up a good point about doing you know, individual tasks. Um, one uh, variable to urban firefighting and standard operating procedures is our individual task assignments. Obviously, um, because of our, 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 our conventional and common deployment uh, strategies and, and, and um, staffing levels, usually what we do is we, we like to scatter our personnel to reach and cover every inch of the fire building. So often that means uh, operating outside of the purview of other firefighters and the company officer and doing individual tasks. And that's one thing you'll get. Obviously, that, that, that's great you'll, um, that you'll have that in truck essentials, but it's actually a, a foundational aspect of, of ur the urban essentials class because um, each uh, evolution that you'll go through is, is really done uh, almost individually based on uh, what you'll be required to do by yourself uh, on the fire ground. Obviously, you might have an engine company waiting with, with water as you're, you know, you're forcing a door, et cetera, or you might be sent to the roof, uh, which I'll have Josh talk about in a moment, um, sent to the roof by yourself to do, you know, a 360 of the uh, survey of the roof, uh, look for any hazards, and, you know, in fact, conduct uh, vertical ventilation. Um, obviously, we do that under the guise of, and I'll say this as a disclaimer, we do that under the guise of, of accountability and and our uh, our two and two up because if if I'm in voice visual or physical contact with another firefighter I'm accounted for so obviously the battalion chief and that uh, truck company rescue company's officer is, is aware that you know Josh is going to the roof uh, to conduct these operations and obviously is going to be able to keep uh, an eye on uh, on him while he's doing that so Josh real quick do you want to kind of uh, you know build upon what I just mentioned and talk about um, operating by yourself on a roof, because that, that's uh, um, what Josh teaches at the uh, FDIC's uh, Urban Essentials Hot Class, and uh, does a phenomenal job on the roof, and uh, uh, definitely uh, provides a lot of information. So Josh, why don't you uh, kind of take it away and let us know what's going on up there on the roof. Uh, before I hit the roof, I want to pass on a quote that, uh, I don't quote me on this, I think it's Chief Dunn, but uh, Captain Morris was talking about it um, in January, he said that FDNY could put 75 men to work without saying a word. And I think that's a product of SO, an SOP type system. Um, and I, I used to work for a suburban fire department across the river, across the water from Seattle. And, and it's amazing to me that we had half the staffing that Seattle has. And now that I'm in Seattle, I find myself working alone in a department that has twice the staffing because we're, we're, prescribing who does what and putting people in position to accomplish tasks that are deemed necessary or important by the administration or by the, uh, just by the fire department. So I thought it was unique that I, I go from a department with half the staffing and I never worked alone to a department with twice the staffing and find myself doing tasks alone way more often. Uh, so with that being said, hit the roof um, at the urban Essentials class, I, I talk about the importance of getting to the roof and all the everything that's that comes along with that. Other than just ventilating the roof, and typically we think of roof operations as, you know, um, what roof construction do we have and make a big hole as fast as we can. But what gets missed a lot, and in, in, especially in my training, was uh, how important it is to, you know, get a 360 of the perimeter of the building, checking the shafts, checking. Uh, for life and the blind shafts on the back where the IC given a report for the chief that doesn't have the luxury of getting the 360 and getting um, a view of all sides of the building. Uh, the naturals, hidden skylights and the scuttle, the scuttle hatches and the penthouse door. Um, I talk about in my class a little bit and I, I go into detail about how many people we have showing up to a, say, a four-story apartment building occupied. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's around 40 people, almost 50 people. And if there's somebody on the landing at the top of the stairs at that bulkhead door, uh, without having someone assigned to the roof and opening that bulkhead door, it could be 15 or 20 minutes before we find that guy or that victim that's on the top of the landing on the other side of that bulkhead door. And this is a well-staffed fire department that shows up pretty quick and, you know, a pretty aggressive mindset uh, with when it comes to search. And if this individual finds a fire on floor two and climbs and gets cut off by fire and climbs to the roof because um, he's cut off and the roof position doesn't get that door open and find him. It could be 20 minutes into the fire that we find this guy. So um, we, we hit on stuff like that, topics like that, and, and single-person forcible entry techniques uh, and ventilation. 
uh, naturals and cutting the roof when, when, when appropriate. Just a couple things that we talk about. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch. No, definitely uh, phenomenal points, especially with, with regards to the bulkhead, because obviously, um, you know, that's something that's not um, typical on a lot of uh, multiple dwellings that you'll find in other parts of the, the country. So it's, it's definitely a building feature that is uh, wonderful for us uh, with regards to controlled and, and uh, wall time ventilation, um, as well as a hazard to occupants um, uh, based on some of the control measures the building owners take to secure those bulkheads and keep yeah, them there's supposed to be a fire uh, exit, right, an egress, and mm -hmm. they get locked up all the time, padlocks yeah. on the inside, so it's not uncommon that you'll find them locked up, uh, yep. wrapped in barbed wire, every, you imagine, you know, everything you can imagine. Yep, and, uh, and again, you know, one of the impetus uh, for developing the Urban Essentials class is uh, taking that bulkhead door every time, um, overcome some of the fortification, typical fortifications that you'll see. Um, now, uh, Rook, we'll get a few more minutes here, but I wanted to... to Talk to Gabe again. Another um, task that's uh, or an individual task that that we're um, actually required to look at, at doing is obviously taking off window bars. Um, myriad methods of doing that based on how they're set into the building, but nonetheless, it's um, removing a window bar is is one of the most important or any window obstruction to getting in or out of the building is one of the most important fire ground operations we can take. And again, you may be tasked with doing it individually and. So, Gabe, you want to kind of describe what, what, what you have going on in that evolution, and, um, and, and is it, in fact, uh, possible to take off window bars with simple hand tools? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, first, I, I'd preface it by saying um, it, it's not necessarily, and this is where, you, you know, all of our instructors will, will speak to you one-on-one -on -one and relate it to where you're working from. So I could say, yeah, you know what, if I'm assigned to the outside vent working on a truck, and, and most of my experience comes with this from, from working in the rescue company when we're citywide, um, but it, you might be on an engine company and have to force bars for any myriad of reasons, like Nick was saying earlier. I mean, just because you're on an engine doesn't mean that this, the first two truck didn't get delayed by anything from a, a, a vehicle accident to, uh, you, know, you know, a train going through an intersection. Um, so, so you've always got to be up on your skills no matter what the apparatus is, but um, my main points at, at the Urban Essentials class is that you can do a lot more than you think you can, and as long as you're really squared away with the tools that you're carrying or what riding position you're assigned, um, you, you can really make a lot of progress with just hand tools before you have to check down and, and make the decision to call for a power tool or to get more people involved. Um, you know, where I'm at, I have 100-year-old buildings, and, and the mortar is shot, um, the, the brickwork is shot. A lot of times these things are lagged in or just built into the actual construction. Uh, some of my main points are that you've got to know when to say when and know when to check down to a saw. Um, size up, like with anything, fire is, you know, if you're looking at the fire's location extent. If you're looking at uh, window bars or, like you said, Eric, it's uh, there's any kind of obstruction there, whether it's a HUD board up, a VPS panel, a window bar. Uh, you know, we've got child restraint bars now that are no longer set in the window to keep the children in. They're stacked up to the top of the window to keep you out. Um, so, you know, so people get creative and they, they do what they have to to protect their property. And um, as a single operator or, a, um, you know, and I laughed because years ago, you know, I joined, I wanted to get assigned to the rescue because it was almost kind of a license to freelance. Like you said, we always, <laughs> we always maintain accountability. I have a radio just because I'm out of sight from someone doesn't mean that I'm not accountable to my boss or something like that. So, um, yes, accountability is absolutely critical and so is coordination. But if I'm finding myself like Josh had stated, like you're going to be operating on your own here and there. And, uh, you know, I wanted to work in a company where I was trusted enough to handle that task and function. Um, so size up of the obstruction is, is critical. Understanding what the construction features are and how the thing is being held in place and how to proceed as efficiently as possible um, are, are the biggest things. That is your particular assignment. Um, you, you know, like Josh is saying, you know what your task is. So, so if you can handle that task without having to call for help or pull in other resources to help you handle that, then that then that's uh, obviously a win for us. You know, 
staffing keeps getting worse and worse. I don't hear of it ever getting better and better. So when I talk, and um, the great thing about essentials is, and I'm sure the same thing is true with the truck class, that you know you have very experienced guys who can talk to you one on one, and you get a little bit of a lecture and a little bit of a hands on, and it's kind of the, the correlation of the two where you can really start to put these educational points to work physically. Um, so, you, you know, we, we talk about size up, we talk about, um, you, you know, what is holding that instruction in place, how to best defeat it, and then we get your hands on it and we talk about not being intimidated and how to size up things properly and how to not get, you know, your ass kicked for lack of a better word, um, you, you know, and knowing when to call for help when you need to. Um, size up is, is very critical and um, you know you can do a lot more with a, a halogen and a flat head axe or a six foot steel hook than you think you can as long as you're stored away on how the tools work, where to apply your leverage and uh, basically the time and place of everything that's going on in a coordinated effort on the fire building. Yeah, outstanding. Um, I'll tell you what folks, we're, we're getting towards the end of our hour here. Um, you know, I'll let uh, our, our guest here give some uh, final thoughts before we sign off here. But I, you know, I want to thank everybody for for watching today. Uh, phenomenal discussion. Thesis of our talk today was, you know, finding what uh, what urban firefighting is, some of the characteristics behind them. Obviously, from listening to to a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, it is applicable to any town in the USA. Everybody has old buildings. Everybody has the same priorities at fires. Um, and you're going to see many of the things that you saw or that you you, you may find in your, your urban fire departments or urban fire grounds uh, in the suburbs or exurbs uh, very shortly. It might take a little while to get there, but it is on its way, folks. And take the truck essentials class. Take the uh, urban essentials class. Uh, get these skill sets, you know, started and ingrained into your in your capabilities. So when you see these these obstacles that are in your way, you're going to, you know, you should be able to flip a switch and, and take care of those problems. Um, again, you know, urban firefighting isn't exclusive to, to any one city or any one part of the country. Um, you know, we, we, we just have to be good enough firefighters to recognize when certain tactics need to be employed in, in strategies. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Chief Martin. Uh, I, I'll take. I want to take my quick minute, uh, I guess, to just first thank Eric and the crew for the the honor of being on here today and be able to share my thoughts and hear the great thoughts the other guys here. Um, Nick Papa put up there on on Twitter. He wanted some advice for the urban engine with three man crews. Man, I feel for you. I've I've been there, and I know other guys have been there. You're in a challenging spot, especially with that rookie. Number one advice is is you got to train that rookie up faster than you would an average guy because you're in an environment there. Uh, where basically you don't have a backup man or you're going to be the backup man when you would like to be at the nozzle with that rookie leading him the way. I'd make sure that, that that rookie knows what you want him to go further into and what you want him to wait on for you because more than likely you're going to end up down the length of hose, moving some hose around the corners and stuff while he's pushing into something you, you wish he wasn't alone at. Um, but just remember, you know, don't get don't get too task oriented on that backup firefighter position. Um, remember, you got to be the officer. You got to be looking at the conditions and stuff like that. Um, it's a challenge, but it's not a challenge you face alone. You know, there's a lot of other guys. I hope who'll jump on Twitter and, and offer you some advice on that. Go again. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I'll take my quick minute to to not only tell. Uh, Nick Papa, who, who, who Nick answered his question pretty good, I, I thought. But uh, as far as the probe goes, I was one at one point, but my junior guy has like 20 years on the job since I got promoted to management company. So I might not be the greatest guy to help you out. But, uh, you, you know, Nick's absolutely right. There's a lot of resources out there where you can um, clearly get a lot of good information. Um, and, and whether we like to say it or not, even though you have four or five people on the rig doesn't always mean you have that many people on the rig. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that, but everyone's skill set is different, and just because you have four guys on a rig doesn't mean you always have four able bodies on a rig. All right, So keep that in mind, and there's a lot of people who you think have great staffing uh, that, that are still behind the eight ball, so to speak. 
Um, beyond that, I'd also like to say that you know the urban essentials and the truck classes are, uh, that Nick works at are, are just fantastic resources for you to come out and and learn a great deal of experience. I think there's not enough experience being taught in, in our service any longer. Um, you know, the crew that Nick works for and the crew at Urban Essentials are just full of 20 and 15 and 30 year guys. Uh, you've got a father-son tandem with, with the Mars side uh, that, that are just like mind-blowing at forcible entry and if you can't come away from that eight hour day with a handful of stuff to bring back to your setting, whether it's suburban or urban, um, then, then, you know, you, you're not paying attention in class. Um, and the same thing can be said for Nick. You know, he's been doing force launchy stuff forever. He, he's very squared away, and, and so is Champo. Uh, those guys probably run a great outfit, and it always – I laugh because I – how many times do I want to just give up my station and walk around? Eric, you've heard me say this before. I, I, want, I want to take this class. You know, I want to go and hear these guys talk because there's so much that you can learn from guys like Josh and guys like uh, Brian McNulty – uh, fr from Milwaukee when they're doing their stuff, or Ron Smith, or, or uh, Mike Champo, or Nick Martin. So, you know, get out the FDIC and uh, take these classes and, and pick the brains of the guys who are who are running the show because uh, they'll, without a doubt, give you plenty of stuff to take back to where you're working. I didn't get to see the question, but uh, it sounds like a question about uh, three-person staffing, and, and I would argue that uh, the answer is probably just a good execution of the basics, uh, no matter what the staffing is. And uh, to kind of dovetail on what Chief was talking about with the outside the box mentality, is uh, usually it's it's it really it just is a, a good execution of the basics and and being at a, operating at a high level. So if you're stuck with limited staffing, that just makes makes you puts more weight on you to be good at the basics and execute at a higher level. Um, I guess uh, the other thing I like to say is a little bit off the subject. We lost a good guy in the Sacramento City Fire Department, uh, Billy Lewis, this last week. So uh, just keep keep uh, keep an eye on your guys and make sure you take care of each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, show's, the show's for you, Billy. Without yeah. a doubt, big yeah. loss in the fire service this week. Let me chime in on that, there, Erica. Billy was a great guy, and I'm feeling for most of his friends out there on the West Coast with uh, Coy and all the brothers out there feeling that loss big time. Um, when we were just doing our thing in Portland, uh, the battalion chief from Chicago, Dan DeGrees, had a lot of really good stuff from Rosecrans and uh, the mental state of um, you know public safety personnel. Uh, if you can get into that or start paying more attention to that, like Josh was saying, uh, our people are hurting inside, and you've got to really start zeroing in on who they are and how you can best help them. Uh, that's a big loss. Yeah, tremendous. Um, with that, folks, we really appreciate you uh, um, watching us today, joining us, and uh, thanks to Bobby Halton and Chief Lasky for allowing us to hijack their week and and uh, allow me to bring on the, the, these great guys to, to chat today. Phenomenal hour. Um, always great talking with these guys. Remember, FTIC is 62 days away. Book your airfare, you know, fill up the gas tank, you know, go to FTIC.com, register, register for Truck Essentials, Urban Essentials, get on it now before they're sold out, and we will see you at FTIC. Again, folks, I'm Eric Roden. Thanks again for watching. Today is Hump Day Hangout. Be safe out there. <laughs>